I'm Mary Parker, and welcome to our video series, A Dose of Science. Today I'm speaking with Ken Henderson, Senior Director of Laboratory Services in Wilmington. Ken is responsible for keeping our research model safe from unwanted bacteria and viruses. But in his winemaking hobby, he has learned that not all microbes are bad. <laughs> Some microbes help turn grapes and other fruits into tasty wines. On his own patch of land in New England, he has grown a small experimental vineyard, which he calls his laboratory. He's here today to teach us about winemaking and how it is not as different as you might think from his daily job monitoring and protecting research models. Welcome, Ken. Thank you, Mary. I hope you feel welcome in your own home. <laughs> Over <Zoom. laughs> yeah, there's not much escaping this these days. No, nope, no, this is kind of where we are from here into eternity. But other than that. <laughs> All right, can we start with a bit of a history lesson? How was wine made at the most basic level 7,000 years ago? Yeah, well, first I'm going to say I am certainly not a historian in, in wines, but, uh, you know, you, you can, anybody can look this up online, but the, really the history is quite fascinating. Um, you know, it's, it predates recorded history, of course. Mm -hmm. And, and one, of the, one of the discussions that I see uh, actually goes back to the days of hunter-gatherers when they actually probably pursued uh, picking grapes up in the trees and probably stored them in vials. And then when they got to the bottom of their, of their grape hoard, they maybe found a, a juice down there at the bottom that just might have been fermented by the, by the yeast that were naturally there mm -hmm. already. And so they, they probably anticipate that's exactly probably how it happened uh, in, you know, in the first place. So how does microbiology factor into making wine in your laboratory? Yeah, and, and, I, and, I, and I know that you know, part of the discussion too, you're interested in, in, in how it reflects off what I do in my job. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't use fancy tools, uh, fancy tools to, to monitor for infectious agents, uh, but we do, we do use our site. We do make observations as all scientists do. You have to make observations in order to determine if something's going right or something's going wrong. Um, and and you, look, you look at in the vineyard, you might look at the back of the leaves, the front of the leaves. Uh, you monitor the grape clusters, how they develop. Uh, because there is there is a plethora, just just like research models, you find bacteria, you find viruses, you find fungi, which are really the biggest one of the biggest enemies uh, from a, um, a viticulture uh, standpoint. Uh, that that really impacts the quality of the grapes that you produce, and so you need to monitor for these uh, different organisms, and you need to. Uh, have ways to fight them, combat them. We do use methods, uh, you've heard the term sulfides? Mm -hmm. All right, so sulf sulfides you'll see on, on, on bottles that say it's really important uh, to have sulfides there. Uh, organic wines uh, do not have sulfides usually, um, and, uh, but they may use sulfur or copper on the vines, which are considered natural chemicals. And that might carry over into the winemaking to allow that last for a little bit longer. So, I mean, obviously there's some chemistry and some microbiology in there, but how does your scientific background uh, factor into your winemaking? Is it as an exact a science as in your lab? Uh, and the answer is yes. If you look in a, a winery such as mine, uh, I'm not a professional winery here, it's all hobby, you'll find pH meters, uh, you'll find uh, uh, devices to measure the amount of, of sulfur uh, in, in the wine that you're making. You'll find titration burettes. Uh, we have to do titration to determine uh, total acidity. Uh, all these things will help us determine if we want to modify the wine uh, in the process. And of course, don't forget sugar content, right? We need to know our sugar content at the very beginning so we know how much alcohol our yeast are going to make for us. Uh, so in your work, you are keeping harmful microbes away from our research models. Do you have anything like that with your grapes, where you're trying to keep things away? Well, the bacteria, you have to sanitize. Um, so uh, we use the sulfites, uh, use that as a kind of a um, sanitizer. I'll use it in my stainless steel. Uh, also use the washout barrels if I'm changing out a wine in the middle, just to make sure there's nothing residual in there uh, over time. Um, but sometimes when you have to be careful when you're cleaning the barrel, because uh, the barrel will actually uh, contain bacteria that you may want to have in your wine when you're done. Um, one of the things we've, we, uh, you know, we've talked about before was malolactic fermentation. Um, and what that is, is the secondary fermentation after the yeast fermentation uh, that breaks down uh, the malic acid into a, a softer lactic acid. Uh, so some of your better wines uh, that you will drink will have gone through malolactic fermentation uh, because it softens the acids when you're, when you're drinking it. Uh, so there are beneficial bacteria as much as there are bacteria that are, that are, that are not beneficial. 
Has there ever been a time where your hobby or, and your work have reflected off each other, where you've learned something in one that applied to the other? Yeah, pro probably the, the one thing that comes to my mind um, the most uh, is a, a lot of times um, we assume that if we find bacteria or something in, in a mouse that it's necessarily bad. Mm -hmm. you know, so they don't always cause disease. In fact, there are many bacteria uh, in, in mice or rats that probably play a beneficial role. We don't look for them. We don't monitor them. Uh, and there's some bacteria that they may have had a, a little history in the past where they may have caused disease. Um, and, and they aren't really as problematic as we thought they were. And, and these, these bacteria kind of create this niche um, inside these mice to kind of protect them against the pathogens. Um, and it's really kind of no different uh, with, with, uh, with our vines and also with our, um, um, uh, the winemaking itself. We want to kind of promote the growth of the healthy bacteria and the healthy fungus because they'll play a role. They'll play an important role to make sure that, that the more uh, unwanted organisms uh, don't come in. So uh, that, that's one way you, I think I can compare the, the, the two different uh, um, two different, I, I guess you'd call them models, two different entities. <laughs> two different activities. Yes. Two different winemaking, sciences. Yeah, why making and science. Well, I guess it's the same, right? Yeah, yeah. In some respects, yeah, absolutely. Let's have a little bit of story time. Can you tell me about the lost Carbonier grapes? Yeah, so one of the things I like to do uh, when I bring a new varietal into my cellar, a new, a new batch of grapes, um, I want to know about it. I want to learn about it. And Carbonier was a wine that I knew was produced mainly in Chile. In fact, 80% uh, of all the Carmenere on the planet is, is produced in Chile. Um, and I knew very little about it. And then I started reading about it and there was this amazing story um, that, uh, that I kept coming upon, coming upon. And, uh, and that story starts off, you know, back in the, back in the 1800s. And, um, and, and Carmenere is a, considered a blending grape. So you've got five primary grapes that you have in Bordeaux right now. You have um, Petit Verdot, a Cab Franc, a Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, Malbec, and, and Merlot. And those are the five that we think of. But there was actually a sixth, and that sixth grape was Carmenere. And, um, and it kind of grew out of popularity, um, maybe because it was a blending grape, and people weren't making solid varietals of it. And so um, they started reducing the amount of it, so they didn't have as much there. Uh, in the 1850s or so, they shipped out a lot of uh, Merlot and, and Carmenere out to, um, out to Chile. Uh, but little did they know, um, the, the Carmenere they sent was a mistake. Uh, they didn't know they were sending Carmenere. They thought they were only sending Merlot. And so we went through this period um, where uh, a root louse called phylloxera uh, was transferred from North America grapes through England and then into Europe and, and destroyed about 95 to 97% of all the vineyards. And so today, all of the European, most of all the European grapes that you'll see over there are grown on North American rootstock because the North American grapes are resistant to it. Mm -hmm. Well, it wiped out a lot of vines in, in, um, in Bordeaux and they really focused on those five main grapes. And so Carmenere was never propagated. And so it was considered the lost grape. And so little did they know uh, between 1815 and, and 1994, so this is recent, um, uh, a, a professor was down traveling uh, in uh, Chile and was tasting their Merlot and he said to himself, this is not Merlot. I, I guess when you have, <laughs> when, you, when you come from a wine institute, you know, uh, yeah. you know, your, you know, your wines, this is not a Merlot. And they did DNA testing. And sure enough, they discovered that it was, it was a uh, Carmenere. And so the grape that they had thought had been lost uh, was found. And so uh, now uh, little did they know how much Carmenere they were producing. They are the, one of the largest global producers of Carmenere. Uh, in the world. I, I have heard that they're, they're, they're transferring Carmenere back uh, into, into France again. Uh, so it'll, it'll, it'll be going back there, I guess going back home again uh, to be reunited with its uh, five uh, sister, sister varietals. <laughs> but the whole time in Chile they were making Merlot and it might have been some Merlot and others might not have actually been real Merlot. Right. That's too funny. All right, well, thank you so much, Ken, for joining us on A Dose of Science. This has been a very fun conversation. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mary.